And this is uh, a video we're doing really to explore and talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with Twitter at the moment and the kind of mass migration that is happening to uh, Mastodon as a different platform. So this is new to all of us, we're all exploring it, we just thought it'd be really useful to bring a couple of people together to have a bit of a chat and talk through some of the issues that are arising. So I'm joined in this video, we've got uh, first of our guest uh, Richard Wilson, thanks for joining us from Stop Funding Hey, and we know that your uh, organisation has just set up an account on Mastodon, is it last week or this week? So uh, kind of new adopter to the platform. We've got uh, Sadia Dar, who is our um, manager working on issues around uh, migrant digital justice at Open Rights Group. And Sadia has been kind of listening and talking to different groups on Twitter and social media and how people are reacting to that and has some reflections on it. And then uh, Jim Killock, who is the chief executive at the Open Rights Group as well. Uh, so thanks all of you for, for taking part of this. Um, I think perhaps, I don't know, it'd be interesting just to hear some of the reflections first, Sadia, because you've been talking and listening to what some people are saying about this move and what people's concerns are. I think that might be a good thing just to open up on. Yeah, so I think that's what I actually spent a large part of my weekend doing. <laughs> um, I was really, um, um, I saw that many folks are leaving Twitter for Mastodon after Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter because of what he plans to do with the platform, such as his concerns around free speech. And um, one of the things I've noticed is the calls to migrate to Mastodon from a lot of what, um, in a recent article written by Professor Sunny Singh, she referred to as white left-leaning accounts and the thoughts being expressed and discussion ta discussions taking place about Musk, Musk's purchase of Twitter, um, beyond going beyond that, for example, on Black Twitter and by other minoritized groups, they're not really being paid attention to in the way that they could. Um, I think there's agreement that the platform will likely grow worse. Um, I don't think that's disputed at all, but I think the threat is perceived differently. And I think this is because of our different lived realities and naturally this affects how, we res how we're responding to this threat. Um, but I'll let the others speak and go into a bit more detail once we've heard of the views. So we know we know there's problems on Twitter, don't we? You know, we've all experienced those of us who've been on Twitter a while have experienced. And, and Richard, your organisation, Stop Funding Hate, is uh, your campaign around kind of getting advertisers to pull out of um, platforms. Is that right? You know, where there's kind of problematic content or harmful content on those platforms. So I just wondered what some of your views were on on this. Yeah, I mean, so Stop Funding Hate is premised on the idea that um, ordinary people have a, a role to play in challenging hate, whether that's in a newspaper like the Daily Mail or on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And one of the ways that we can actually exert a little bit of power is that all of us are going to be customers of a company that advertises in one of these platforms. And even if the platforms don't care what we think, the companies we shop with care what their customers think so we've been aware we've supported various calls at various times for temporary boycotts of facebook temporary pauses uh, for advertising on twitter that's something that we we've, we've been engaged with for a number of years uh, we're not leaving twitter and we completely understand um why people don't necessarily want to leave twitter but i think what's really exciting is that we've now got the option with mastodon of potentially having a different platform that we can also be on that operates according to different rules and doesn't have that same incentive behind it to fuel hateful uh, rage inducing content because they're not reliant on advertising in the same way. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So what you're saying is actually almost like the advertising revenue and commercialization drives the moderation um, policies of the big kind of corporately owned platforms and that that then is part of the cause leading to more of this kind of harmful harmful content yeah and i mean it, the, the 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 terrible thing i don't necessarily i don't think that the people that created the big tech companies consciously sat down and said let's have a machine for incentivizing the most extreme and hateful forms of behavior but kind of unintentionally that's kind of what's developed and you know in the last few months alone i've seen overt calls for genocide on twitter and what's really shocking is that the standard of moderation seems to vary 
and this is already as Twitter already was before the before the current change. So um, there's been some progress made. People tell me on levels of moderation in 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 content published in English, but then content published in local languages in Ethiopia or in India um, is moderated far less well already. Um, so if you take away that moderation infrastructure, I think the concern many people have is that, that those problems just could get a hundred times worse. Really interesting. Thank, thanks, Richard. Um, now, out of all of us, I think, Jim, you've had the account the longest on this platform. I guess you, you were an early adopter of uh, Mastodon. You've been an advocate for, um, I know, open source software and, and what it provides. So perhaps it'd be interesting to hear some of your views, perhaps how you think the platform might help with some of these, these problems or what have you? So I, th I think there are two things here. The reason I've been really interested in Mastodon is not because just because it's an open source thing or anything like that. It, it, it's that it is an open protocol. And it's like like email in that sense. It's an open protocol. And that means that anyone you know can talk to it. Twitter could open itself up and it could talk to these uh, Mastodon nodes if it wanted. Um, and it, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because it wants us all locked into its platform. And at this point where we're all facing this choice between uh, potentially having to pay to have our content looked at uh, sufficiently and for that to go directly to the pockets of a company that is now overtly uh, pro quite extreme politics in the United States, I mean, that's an awful dilemma for us to all be in. And and, and what, what essentially uh, both Facebook and Twitter are doing is saying, if you want to reach mass audiences, you have to work with us. You have to pay for our advertising. You have to use us. And if you uh, don't like it, well, you can go and join some tiny little platform and talk to geeks if that's really what you want to do. But, you know, frankly, no one's going to be listening to you. So you're going to have to stay with us. And when that's Elon Musk dictating those terms, that is beyond just an ab the abusive relationship that Richard has described. I mean, it is just um, entirely immoral for anybody uh, to be involved with. And I think that that kind of is now getting to the point where people are kind of asking themselves, well, how long will we stick this? And you add to that the kind of chaos that he's doing in the in in the in that company. I think you know there are, there are a lot of dangers for it. it you know it, it may really really suffer very badly over the next few months. So there are a kind of combination of practical reasons why people need to look somewhere else, and kind of uh, others. But you know we're still stuck with this basic thing that if we do all leave Twitter, if lots of people do leave Twitter, um, or it is forced, you know just just happens that the company ceases to be uh, very functional, then people are going to lose huge amounts of work and effort, as well as access to those audiences that stay on Twitter. And that's a terrible, terrible dilemma for everyone to be in. So for me, the interesting thing is that we could escape this, right? If, if, if the government's said, well, I'm sorry, Twitter, if somebody wants to talk to you out from outside of Twitter, uh, that's necessary because otherwise you're just abusing your market power. They could legislate for that. And we got very close to powers like that uh, being introduced in Europe um, only a year or so ago. They, they failed to implement those. And so we're in this position where we have governments who don't quite have the ability and competition authorities who don't quite have the ability to uh, force this change. But it's there for us if we want. And we have a model in in Macedon where we can see how this world could work. So that's half of it. And the other bit, which I'll be, maybe we'll come back to later, is just that because it's been developed, uh, the platform that we see there now has been developed by communities who are very disadvantaged. So uh, particularly LGBT people, but also newer diverse people and um, people with several sorts of disabilities. The, the sort of uh, culture there is, for instance, to, to really make it accessible for people with sight difficulties, um, to essentially make a calmer discussion for people to offer content warnings so that if they feel uh, that, that certain sorts of conversation is stressful, that they can avoid those things. Um, the, the posts are longer, so people have um, slightly more considered discussions. And many of the things which really push uh, kind of arguments on Twitter um, are, are, are disadvantaged. 
Um, and and so, and it's only users who push content up. It's not an algorithm. So if you want to retweet something, that pushes the content around. But the, there's no algorithm saying, oh, great, everyone's engaging with this and everyone's having a fight, so let's push that up, right? Which is basically what we're talking about on yeah. Twitter. So in terms of accessibility, though, because I know one thing people have been saying to me is like, well, what is a server? You mentioned like nodes, like some of this language is not accessible unless you are from a kind of tech um background or you you understand it whereas i think one thing the big platforms have done like facebook and twitter and google these service providers they make it so easy for like people to sign up and and use their service it is very convenient for a lot of people and i think what we're hearing at the moment i I decided you might want to come in on this is 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 we're hearing actually a lot of groups saying there's there's barriers to getting onto this and there's barriers in terms of like understanding how it works and, and using this technology i mean i don't know what what I mean, I've heard groups say it. Have you heard, Sadia? Yeah, I um, I think it goes back to a point I like mentioned, um, raised earlier. I do think, um, yeah, people are perceiving this threat differently, and I think there's like a lack of understanding about how different communities, particularly those that are vulnerable and marginalised and minoritised, how they how they have been using Twitter and how they use Twitter and the Jim mentioned communities, the significance of the communities that they've been able to create, join and be a part of on the platform and the worry that these won't be able to or can't necessarily be replicated on Mastodon. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's really interesting because I think we, this insight is so important. I think that, um, you know, uh, we need to be listening to to what these groups are saying. Uh, why did they join Twitter? How do they use Twitter? Why aren't they leaving Twitter? <laughs> um, all these questions are really, really important. And uh, going back to communities again, we're not just talking about individuals relocating. We're talking about communities, like each with their own norms, motivations, that, um, that uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, the threats that they that we all agree on are also things that they face in their lives offline as well um so i think there needs to be a lot more i think it would be really great to have a dis like bring groups together and have a discussion about this maybe yeah that's something that we could do at org yeah i think there's there's some interesting things I mean, I, i'm you know hopeful i'd be interested to hear what richard thinks a bit more on this you know i, I may be hopeful that a community-based moderation might actually you know, provide people more choice of kind of where they want to go, what moderation they want, and make it easier for people to form communities where they aren't exposed to as much kind of hateful content. You know, it's fine, isn't it, to have like that puppet square that like Musk talks about, but actually if you're being like heckled by the powerful or people are shouting at you, you can't really enjoy that puppet sphere, whereas you might actually want your more of a private kind of public space and i think perhaps mastodon provides that with the kind of being able to pick what server you want but i'm still finding my way around it i'm not an expert on how this works but um and there doesn't seem to be any advertising on it at the moment so and there won't be i i think i think the key sorry i don't don't interject i think the key thing is uh you can that it does have very strong moderation and people who are trolls dog pilers um fascists they're, they're just kept out so the the question is whether the scale and the reach that twitter provides um you know it, is it is is enough of a benefit to kind of continue to put up with the problems or whether possibly some of the some of the conversations might be better had in these new platforms i think it's an incredibly important point that we we need to listen to the comments that are being made and the 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 points that are being made around um the the experiences people have already been having with hate and abuse uh which we are aware is disproportionately targeted at particular communities already uh it's not like none of this stuff was already there and it's not like you know it i think so I, I think that a lot of people are concerned it could get a lot worse, but I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge how bad it already has been um, and and listen to that and, and, and take that into account um, going forward. I mean, from our point of view, I, I don't think it needs to be an either or. I think, I think, you know, stop finding hate 
currently has no intention of leaving Twitter or telling anyone else that they should. Um, we may not have a choice. <laughs> it might be that the platform collapses. Who knows? It might be that, you know, the new owners decide that they're yeah. going to completely change the moderation rules and suddenly what we do is no longer legal. So one of the reasons that we set up on Master was we just didn't know how much longer we were going to be able to continue on Twitter. But I think the question of what needs to happen next and what points need to be thought through it is something that really needs a big conversation with with many organizations including people who have experiences of how bad things have been already and i think that would be a great thing for org to convene actually i i just want to say i think that point is so important about like the levels of hate people have experienced like already like have experienced online like i was quite interested to read um like earlier today that um uh there was an article written earlier this month by professor meredith clark and um, she's written about black twitter and she said that um particularly for those on the margins within black twitter like black women black trans folks black poor people that actually whenever awful things have happened online they've like you know they've left or like cycled on and off the platform you know, they've used it in that way. And then like there was a, something else that I read where Professor Sunny Singh was saying that, um, you know, she can't remember a single occasion where any action has been taken against a user who she reported for violent threats and abuse, which she receives on a daily basis. So I also like, I don't know how to put this in like a, I also think it's, um, it's quite interesting because I think none of this is good and we would all agree that but i also think people's like threshold people's like what they experience and what they will put up up with i guess if you've been used to a certain level it's not that you're like oh well you know what i don't mind i'm used to this so i'll put up with it but it's also like i think also at the same time like richard has said it's not new to people people face some terrible awful things on this platform day in day out and so when people are saying oh we all need to leave because things are going to get worse i think some people are like okay well how much more worse is it going to get because actually my lived reality is pretty what is pretty bad and i live this both online and offline so i think these are mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree there would be really really insightful to have a conversation with them um, I, I know org on the sector support strand we work not just with migrants rights groups but with you know groups um uh affected by uh policing and it'd be really great to have people in a room and uh be able to talk these things through yeah it's an interesting area isn't it i think there's a lot of future work to be done yes talking to other um organizations about like how to use the platform talk around some of these issues but it also ties into the current debates we have at the moment around things like the online safety bill and government's attempts to kind of control or censor kind of harmful content online and other models and ways in which kind of communities can moderate mm -hmm. for themselves and, and kind of combat it with other approaches so thanks ever so much all of you for participating in it if you've enjoyed this video let us know please do comment on this below join in this conversation uh, around this i know many of you will be posting this on across our social media platforms so do participate get involved with us and get involved in this discussion i think this is a really exciting moment actually where we're having this conversation uh, online around what we want from our social media you know there's big changes big changes with Twitter at the moment big changes in terms of what's happening at Facebook and Meta and I think it is quite an exciting time